check anybody? Spoke easy. Bud Light. It's always that. It's like it's it's almost as if Anheuser Busch is saying, hey, by the way, they put a little put a little notice on the can saying, when when you finished your product, just dump it on the side of the road and somebody who drinks real beer will come along and clean up your can. I just really can't stand litter. I've always just abhorred litter. In fact, so much so that we've, we've developed these trail trash bags from when we're off-roading. Um, I don't know what it is. There's, there's, the, there's this person in Vermont, and it's not a person, it's a type of person who just feels it's okay to take your Bud Light can, drink it in the truck, and throw it and they don't, they don't throw it off the road. Like, you won't think, you're like, oh, I'm gonna whip it into the woods. But occasionally you find that. But 95% but of the time, mile, you find, straight. this is, I think, true all over the country. Because I, on my Facebook feeds with people like me, we, we constantly Bud Light cans and they, they drop them. It's like there's some code, there's some unwritten code that they use to just drop it on the road as if, as if they're saying, hey, I'm gonna litter this because I know somebody like Peter Vollers will come after me and clean it up. It's a la carte. It is Saturday of the weekend before the Overland. And what we are doing is driving the course to make sure it's clear of liquor, bottles and beer bottles and, and general, you know, trash and litter. We're also checking the class four roads, the Pave sectors, to see if there's any erosion, any things that need to be fixed. We're gonna clear a lot of sticks out of the way that have fallen during the storms, and just making sure it's as good as it can be. Pave sector one is a break-in Pave sector, just as, it's mild. I mean, you can really ride this thing at speed. It's also, you're, you're winded here, because you've just done Jenny Road, you've just done Caper Hill. This is actually the top of Caper Hill. So by the time you're up here, you are inside out if you're trying to stay with whatever group you're in. It's the mistake a lot of people make early in the Overland on toward is that they, ah! one of the mistakes they make is that they go way too hard in these early sectors. And they, just to try to be up front and everything else, you can't do that. Because you may still feel good because there's a break in the middle of the ride, but all of that comes later. At the last 10 miles, your efforts right here are where that, where that really starts to hurt. Pave 2 is the tough Pave section. This is the Koppenberg. This is one of our steep, hard, tough traction, more technical Pave sector. It's still early on, so it's very thick with riders. Lots of riders out here. Three, Queen Victoria Road, it is in great shape, it is fast, it is running really fast. We have no erosion ditches, no nothing, not even any sticks. I think that's because it's so well used by the equestrians, so they really clear it out. Plus I think it's actually a legit thoroughfare, like people actually use it to drive on, to cut over through town, so that right looks great. So far all the Pave sectors look really good. I mean the only one, Pave 2, has had a lot of recent work done to it with big stones, so that's gonna be technically challenging, but all the better. It's definitely all rideable. There's nothing so far that is not completely 100% rideable. It's just a matter of care. We are coming up on Brownsville Village. This is one of the changes to the course I made. I made the, after the super hard first 12 miles, I made it so you've got a just nice floating downhill into the village, so when people are riding the course, they can, the course goes that way, but if you're riding it, just coming out to ride, which people are in droves these days, because it's such an iconic course, you stop at the awesome Brownsville Butcher and Pantry, go to the bathroom, get it, get lunch, fill up water, do whatever you need to do, which is practically right on the course now. So it's right at the halfway point. It's awesome. Pave 4. 
it is awesome. It actually is really good. It's a little rough in the beginning. It's a, it's a challenging section to ride. The, 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 the more skilled are gonna ride that part, but it's super easy to dismount and just run over the rock pile in the beginning. The downhill is looking sweet. We just cleared it from, cleared a bunch of sticks off of it. It's dry for the most part. There's like a one little wet section, but no, this is flying. And actually there's a nice, there's, what's happening now with these pave sectors is a, is a bike path is actually getting made because so many riders are pre-riding the course. They, there's actually a, 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 a good line that's actually coming out of it where you can just follow that line. It's, it's awesome. So this, my friends, Pavi sector number five, the Ehrenberg Forest. And it is really a little bit like the actual Ehrenberg Forest in Perura Bay. We have cobblestones. I mean, they are not like, they're natural cobblestones. I mean, this is like seriously rugged rocks and it's downhill. So you're coming down this thing. Last year, I was behind your group. You guys had to be doing 30, 30 miles an hour coming down here. It was crazy. It was amazing. We could, we could literally, I couldn't even, you drop me in the truck. You guys coming down and the key to this stuff is to take it easy. I mean, the front group is going hell for glory, but everybody else should be just, just take it easy. These things are not won on a section like this. You survive a section like this. We ride these, these cut types of roads every single week on the Wednesday night gravel ride. And the key to it is use your arms, use your legs as suspension, pick a good line and when in doubt, slow it down. Because if you get going too fast, you get out of control, you're gonna go over the bars and you're, you're gonna land on rocks like this which is just not good. So that's the key for this section. It is just one of the most awesome sections too. It has a great entry by an old farmhouse. It's a long section of pave. You come down this rocky, rocky road, then you get into some sand and some a couple little mud holes, and then you've got a steep wall at the very end of it that just saps all of your strength, and you're just putting every bit of, every bit of wattage you have into the bike. And then you get to the top of that, and you have a crazy improved road, gravel road downhill to a paved road. So it's all that, and you're tired at this point. This is 10 miles to go. This is where, this is the witching hour. This is where people start to come unglued. So you've just done a very long climb to get up here. You've been feeling great before that because you had the flats and then all of a sudden you're, you're starting to climb and climb and climb and climb. And then you got a pave sector. You do have a nice sag stop. The Rastri teats a sag stop, which is a full on party. Take advantage of that stop, get watered up because the last eight miles are no picnic as well. Claremont, Pave 7, final sector, has like a gradual climb on the improved road, and then you get onto class four here where it's relatively improved, and then there's just a wall. And then there's a flat section at the top, and then a really technical downhill that is basically the beginning of the downhill all the way to the finish. It is super fast and very technical. Uh, I always like to put in one final decisive climb, and at Suicide 6, it used to be the climb up to the backside of Suicide 6. And um, just because you always, you almost with, with a 45 mile distance, you're always gonna have some guys together. And it gives a chance for the strongest guy in that group to let loose and go. Um, granted, this climb is not as severe as previous courses, but it's pretty friggin' severe. Only because it's compounded. You have, you, have, you have a gradual climb, and then a little bit of a climb, and then a rocky wall, which is what we're doing right now. So this is the Eau de Claremont final sector. The climb itself is not where things actually happened last year. I think you guys all stayed together, and then it was at the very top. As soon as everybody started reaching for their bottle, that's where Ted just put the hammer down and went. And it was like, <clears throat> what was amazing is that he held everybody off going through the technical downhill and last year we had to deal with that whole uh, downhill section was logged so it was just soupy mud we did the best we could to create two tracks with the trucks but it was really soupy and you guys just sailed right through it but you were all like separated by like 30 meters all the way to the finish line it's pretty amazing totally psyched this is the main river pasture this is actually your team parking a lot of camping will happen here People are camping overnight, will mainly be camping along the river here. 
and we've got my buddy Ben Waters who's going to help me put in the little bridge that goes across the river so we're not driving through and then we have beautiful camping across the river in the woods it lines the other side and it's nice and shaded and it's private we'll also be parking cars there and then we have our final overflow parking just down the road but we have a path that leads right to the back area across the river and across the bridge and you're at the venue everything is super super close we have camping above the house over there um and we have i mean we have camping over there we have parking over there and we have a lot of overflow parking in uh, my neighbor's pasture across the way so it's going to be tight, it'll be intimate, but that's kind of the beauty of the Overland is that people people come here and it's, you're at my house, you're my, you're my house guest for the weekend. <laughs>